Hey, it's great to see everybody. For being here. Uh, some folks took some initiative, which in Tlingit would say isatutin. Use your initiative. Uh, and started writing some greetings, or how to say good day, in some of the indigenous languages that are represented here. So I would like to open the floor to folks who would like to share uh, that with us in the language you are working, which we did we did before I hit record, but I thought we'd do it again so that we'd have the recording. Who wants to go first? Should we start with Doug Jews, who started us off in chat, <laughs> and just go down the list? There we go. Doug Jews, you want to say it in Hatkil? Um, Sangaila. Sangaila. How ah? And who wants to share it in Tlingit? Ah, or just your key, your key. Okay, okay. Oh, but don't turn your audio on if you're no. signing on in here. We'll get the feed, the loop. Rave style, good day. <laughs> and uh, how about Schmelga? Uh, we had Wainit, which is hello, and then Amagari Sulgex is what Godin Tivan brought in, and that's uh, good afternoon. Fabulous. Damn. Uh, that brings us to Bering Strait, the Lupiak. Ublulotak. 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 Koyanak. And Gwichin. Twin Gwinzi. Twin Gwinzi. Masi Cho. And Nangam Tunu. Am Arala. Am Arala. And Tanake. Dan Nazum. Dan Nazum. Oh. Dan Nazum. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, let's see, I thought today, so we've read quite a few things. So I wanna share with you folks uh, the notes that I took and then maybe what we can try and do is just, we'll just grab some topics and we're just gonna talk them out because the, the reading uh, is really important. And then I'm hoping it's spurring a whole bunch of thoughts and we also want to make sure that we're getting into continuing to remain in conversations about what's relevant to our work. At some point today, we'll also look at the gids or the geeds, depending on your dialect, uh, which is Fishman's way of measuring where your language is at and gives you some ideas on goals to set. And so the reading on Mohawk language, uh, the root word method referred to that. And we can also look at act, actful as well. Uh, let's see. And then we've got our groups for sign up. Uh, so starting next week, we're going to start just looking at some methodologies. As we look at methodologies, I'll just continue to say that I think a methodology for teaching uh, can be sort of foundational if you want it to be. Like you could be a Montessori program or a Waldorf program, or you could be the total physical response or TPRS could be like a pretty foundational part of what you're doing. But it, it could also be just a tool that's in the box. So yeah, we use TPR to get ourselves started and to do warm ups and to do activities. Uh, and so basically we're gonna break into teams and each team is gonna just present on one of these methodologies. So you're gonna just go out there, find some stuff, come back, share some things. What is it? Who made it? How is it used? What are some 
uh, areas that might be sort of problems or maybe it runs out of gas at some point what are some of your critiques of it and then uh, then we'll just open it up for a discussion so as we look at which things are upcoming uh, I want us to also make sure that we are being supportive of our fellow students and we're also going out and just finding some stuff on our own say what can I find out about where are your keys this week and what can I find out about the Paul Creek method and and so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll take a closer look at that uh, probably today as well. We'll start our sign-in sheet and make sure that folks have an idea of what they're doing. And then we'll um, just kind of go from there. So kind of thinking about the most recent set of readings and class notes, I'm going to share a few things with you folks. I'm going to make this bigger. So what I like to do when I'm reading is I just go through and I just make a list of uh, notes. And some of those things are, you know, if Dr. William Wilson's talking, of, keeps using the word tertiary study, and I'm reading it and I think, I don't know what that is. So then I go and look it up. And it's, it's another way to say higher education. So higher education, college, university, uh, technical programs, those are all tertiary education. Uh, we're going to map out some things today. So I'm really curious, like when we read about organizations, I'm curious about the process of just sort of figuring out how every organization is linked, what they do, and how you sort of stay as united as you need to be to build a language movement. And, and some of that has to do with not duplicating the work, some of that has to do with language ideologies, which are sometimes conflicting. And what do you do when there's conflicting ideologies? If you invite someone to the meeting so you can pitch the idea of a medium school, and then halfway through the meeting, the person you invited to back you up says, well, our organization doesn't support a medium school. You got to be ready for that kind of stuff because I've been there. It was, uh, it was rough. And then uh, I was thinking about capacity. What can we do now? So I, I'm in several meetings and we talk about forming these different committees and these different working groups at the state level, at the federal level. But then sometimes we just say, well, who's going to do the work? And do we have enough people who can? And how do we get there? So sometimes I'm thinking of things in terms of like, what do we do right now? And what do we do in the future? How do we do the now? How do we do the later? Um, there's a number of different passages as we sort of come through that I think about. So uh, this one, indigenous language decline and loss is not only a language issue, but rather a complex web of political, historical, sociological, psychological, and educational issues. I want us to think about what does long-range language planning looks like look like and what does short-range language plan look like uh, what i was reading about programs you know we are reading about that cognitive behavioral therapy to support uh, the term shifts they, there are folks who grow up with indigenous languages if you talk to them they can understand you like there was one that uh, I'm, I could think of right now. That one time I was speaking in Tlingit and I realized she was translating everything for her husband. And then I started to listen as I was talking and it was kind of fun because she could translate very accurately. But if I wanted to just speak Tlingit with her, I think she would have had a hard time. So I, I think it's really interesting to think about what are the, what are the therapeutic needs for folks who might be at that spot. And it's happened to me in, in several other occasions as well. They want us to think about and talk about. And so what, I'm just gonna go through this stuff, then we'll go through, pick one that you're interested in, sort of talking about a little bit more. Indigenous control of indigenous language programs. What is the role or what are the roles of linguistics and linguists? 
And what are the roles of outside agencies, partners, uh, folks who come to maybe learn and study the language? And is there a, a plan for how that stuff goes in terms of the politics of it and the power and sometimes the decision making? For resources, uh, if, if you're in the resource development stage, some things to think about are dictionaries. Are you in control of your own dictionary? Would you like to be? Grammars, is there some book that teaches the grammar of the language? Uh, handbooks for learners, however you want to sort of get folks started at various levels. Audio, video, apps, websites. I'm sure in five years from now there'll be other things. I thought it'd be fun to translate Facebook into think it was so it's so much work. It's an incredible amount of work. So uh, just thinking about these things, like sometimes you have to pick which things you're going to try and what you're going to do. Then we read about the role of the university in indigenous language revitalization. Uh, what do we have? What is needed? And then. Uh, yeah, like so thinking about the language, uh, there's these different sort of realms that we were talking about and reading about as well. So this could be as a marker to outsiders. So it could be really interesting to bring your place names back and to really make it seem like it's not just one generic Alaska, but that it is very specific to the places where the languages are. For internal ritual use, so for ceremonies and other cultural activities, for home and community use, and then for governmental use. So should the board meetings be run in the language? Should language knowledge be a requirement or some sort of benefit for folks? And then language use with non-Indigenous peoples living on Indigenous land. And then, sorry, I just I think about all this stuff, and I'm like, oh, I gotta talk to these guys about all this stuff. So how do you balance these things as a language teacher and learner? Memorization, grammar, speech patterns and identity, belief in self and the ability to go into the deep depths of the language. Here's a few other, a couple other passages. Developing high proficiency is a considerable challenge when a program is attempting to assist college-age adults to master an endangered language that is not the normal language of daily life anywhere. So this is pretty common that you'll take a language course and you'll be two, three years in, and then someone will ask you how to say something and you don't know how to say the thing. And so uh, a big part of that is probably the language isn't pushing itself into a total language environment. And then uh, faculty hired to teach and revitalize indigenous languages can easily be diverted from language revitalization by the requirements and attractions of academia that are designed for the dominant culture rather than for hands-on revitalization of a suppressed language. So if someone gets a tenure track position, but then they're, you know, they're expected to be writing grants and they're expected to be publishing papers and they're expected to be doing double-blind peer-reviewed articles and and stuff like that, then they might just be trying to keep their job and, and sort of excel within their job rather than focusing entirely on the language. Under cultivating a community of users, uh, what does, yeah, like how do you, how do you create a, a whole group of users and whole groups of users so that you can, as you travel to your communities, there are active language users in every one of the communities. Uh, and how do you do that? Then some other thoughts I had is, can you teach your grammar in your language? Uh, I was in some Hawaiian language classes. I saw how they do that. It was really amazing. And they don't use English to teach their grammar, which I think is pretty huge. And if, uh, if not, how would you do so? What do you need? How many hours is a language course? How many of those hours are spent in the target language? Uh, what are the strategies to re reduce reliance on English? 
And what are the strategies to encourage those who cannot yet speak to participate without feeling alienated? Then, uh, a thousand homes, a thousand dreams. Uh, there's just some notes in here. So, Evi is a tribe. Uh, I guess it's Iwi. And then I think the WH is an F sound. So, Fanao is an extended family. I, wasn't sure. I think Potiki is like a young uh, sibling, perhaps. Then I was just thinking, like, well, what's. We read some stuff from New Zealand, we read some stuff from Hawaii. Uh, but one of the things that those two places have in common is even on a whole set of connected islands, you have one language. There's several dialects, but you have one language. Whereas in Alaska, you have 23 languages. And I think there are some absolute benefits to having 23 languages. And then there are some difficulties to having 23 languages. Uh, if you look at California, they have you know, more than that. So. Uh, then I was thinking, how do you overcome the ruptures of loss? Like a lot of folks just feel completely disconnected to indigenous languages, and how do we continue to to gap those those ruptures? Uh, how do you focus, or do you? And you don't have to. You can reject the choice altogether too. Do you focus on a small group and try to get them to a high fluency, or do you try to just get everybody? going or do you do both right how do you uh how do you what's your process for planning and how do you monitor and update the plan so it doesn't just sit on a shelf uh or in some file nowadays uh do you have support from the upper divisions of your administrations or is the angsta corporation behind you is the tribe behind you is the the other groups behind you and then how do you overcome apathy? That's a, that's a big one, which is, you know, it comes in a variety of different ways. I think uh, too late now, should have done something. Uh, and then sometimes just not even thinking about it. Then uh, what would the situation be? What would it look like if you said, Wow, our language is safe. What would that scenario look like? A few more things to go through, then we'll just, we can flip back up, pick through this stuff. So uh, this one had a lot of what I would consider like really pullable quotes. There's some really good stuff. Like they all have good stuff, but sometimes I'll read an article and I'll just say, yeah, that's, that's really good content. So uh, there's a number of these. I'm probably not going to read all of them, but just sort of saying, like really looking at the bombardment of culture and how that, not just like prohibiting indigenous languages, but these negative perceptions of the language and negative perceptions of the culture, which I think was the total package of, of colonialism and anti-indigenous racism uh, that, that was very, very prominent at the time and now I think echoes in a wide variety of ways today. Uh, it's real easy to sort of get into, uh, well, what we've got to, the real focus now is getting the land back. And then once we get the land back, then we get financial power. And then once we get financial power, then we take control, we build our own education system, and then we do the language thing. So. It's, it's tough because as indigenous peoples, you're fighting to just hold on to everything. So also trying to sort of push back on this idea that this thing will come after these other higher priorities, which, which are priorities. Uh, and then just some numbers on what the uh, situation for Maori looked like in some ver various areas, uh, language assessments, uh, and then we also read about that in the in the Mohawk reading. Let's see, creating lofty goals. I thought this was pretty wonderful. Say a thousand homes, a thousand dreams, and just I think there's something very uh, appealing about some of these things, just in terms of like it's a nice phrase, nice thought, and then also sort of like 
On the other side, just like, you know, what are your goals? Especially this goal was set, you know, it's not like it was just set this year. Uh, so if you were to sort of look like, what's the goal look like in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, so that when we are 10, 20, 30 years from now, you can sort of say, how effective have we been and what do we have to adjust? Uh, we're going to look at Fishman. We'll look at what this GIDS is and how to sort of use that. I really like this idea of excursions in the language, which I think just really creates some amazing, fun opportunities, going skiing, going to hot springs, going just like whatever the greatest things are, go do that and bring along the language learning community. Uh, so that we're always in the classroom and on Zoom and you know, we should have, be having all the, you know, I went to the first immersion I ever went to. It was a 10 day thing at Glacier Bay Lodge. It was, it was amazing. They fed us. They, I mean, I don't know how to do this stuff, but um, make it nice huh? and then make it fun too. So you can go do fun stuff and take the language out there. So there, there's a lot of ideas that we can talk about too, where and could the language community of learners just all reserve a restaurant for any, like everybody's going to buy their dinner or we just have it. I don't know who's going to buy us dinner. Somebody buy us dinner. But then like the whole restaurant becomes this. You're buying us dinner? All right. They're going to get But you know, just, but this becomes a language event or could we get, uh, could we get a restaurant that would say, uh, yeah, we're going to give you guys a super sweet price because we believe in what you're doing and we'll be known as the restaurant who said this is a wonderful idea and we're going to help make it happen because I, I think you can get institutions on board with supporting things although some of the bigger like big huge chain places aren't always the best because they just have their larger policies sometimes better to go with the local places let's see Native speakers of a language raised by second language speaking parents. That's, I think, for a lot of us, our current goals. And then lastly, the root word method. Uh, I, I know Deho, he's one of the co-authors of this. Uh, so it, this was fun reading. So it's from the Routledge uh, handbook. I think it's called the Handbook of Language Revitalization. And uh, it's fun because William Wilson was one of our teachers and then uh, Deho was in our PhD cohort. So uh, polysynthetic language is a language that has a whole bunch of small parts that have their own meaning and it smooshes them together to, to create language. Uh, most Native American languages are polysynthetic, so a lot of us could share things in terms of how we teach and how we document the language and how we sort of... A, a big thing that this article is looking at is are you teaching entire language, like big phrases and stuff, or are you just going to teach them all these individual components and how to smoosh them together? Uh, a morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a language. Syntax is the order of words and how they come together. So syntax has a lot to do with grammar. Uh, the pragmatic knowledge is knowing how the language is used for different purposes. So you can know how all these things come together, but do you know the cultural components that are supposed to go? Do you know what you're supposed to say and do during a variety of different things that are social things, cultural things, ceremonial things? And then the semantics is, uh, the semantic knowledge is knowing like what kinds of things you're supposed to do that are not really at the word particle level or at the grammar level, but have to do with the tone of voice, the, the way you speak, the way you correct people. Uh, you know, you, you could talk to, the, you know, it's very common, I think, in a lot of uh, Native American indigenous cultures, and they're, they're all different, but there are some common things, like if you've got to understand the kinship structure, so you know who you can boss around and, and stuff like that, and who bosses you around, and then, uh, oh, that's the prosody side of it. Sorry, I was getting them mixed up. The semantics is knowing, um, well, I think of when we're looking at this stuff, because sometimes when you put a set of words together, they have special meaning. 
Like in Tlingit, we have this phrase, where if you didn't know the cultural context of how that phrase works, you really probably wouldn't understand what it means. It means we'll just imitate our ancestors. And then the, the prosody of the language is the rhythm and, and just making it sound like the language sounds. Which made me think of this phrase from Tinik Pangi, who was also in our cohort, who's Chamorro. And he said at one point, I speak my grandmother's language, but I don't speak like my grandmother. And I know we've talked a little bit here, maybe today, just in terms of like contracting phrases and slang that comes in the language. And as you get a, a whole group of younger learners, they're going to use the language in different ways. Every language has this. And it's some questions like, how do you talk about and teach grammar? How do you create speakers and language use? How do you assess the speakers that you have? Um, and yeah, so then I, I had a quote as well, just about uh, how a lot of, how sometimes people are scared to use the language if they don't know how to use the language. And that comes back to this idea we've been talking about, which is overcoming the psychology of use. So these are my notes from this week and last week. I've got some notes from the week before as well, which we can review. But I thought I'd just sort of go over those and then just say, um, let's open it up for discussion. What kinds of things do you folks want to talk about today? Uh, and then I'll make sure that before we leave, we'll look at the GIDs and then uh, a couple other things. Jane. Uh, yeah, um, something I noticed today when we were listening to um, about the Maori, that was my first thought too, was the fact that they had one, one language. Uh, I heard them say they had a different northern dialect, which was <laughs> interesting because we're used to hearing that too. I was thinking, you know, Klekwan Duck uh, dialect. But so they only had a few dialects and one language to reaffirm. So that gave them the ability to focus on uh, generational niches, you know, the, of the family, family language camps and those kind of workshops. Like, I think those are really good because there are family classes, but not everyone's gonna be able to commit to those. And then there's individual programs like the one we're in, but then, you know, we face, you know, where are we going to use the language? And so, they had such a multifaceted uh, system meant for age groups and uh, families. So, yeah, I mean, however we could make a system that, you know, is solely focused on where you're at in life, I guess, you know, that'd, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Jeez. Well, one thing it, it does make me think about, so, a few years ago, we had a language class, and um, well, I kind of had an idea. I said, like, let's take the beginning uh, Tlingit class, the intermediate Tlingit class, the advanced Tlingit class. And this is before every class was stacked with distance components as well. We used to sort of, I think we did them a little different, or maybe we told the distance students to, to uh, try and figure out how to do this on their own. So we all met at... Uh, a grocery store here in town. It's a large grocery store. Uh, I won't say who they are because when I called and I said, can we just come to your store and just use our language and do some activities? And they weren't that excited about it. I thought they'd be kind of excited. Uh, but I was always thinking like grocery stores make these announcements and stuff. Wouldn't it be fun if they made some of them in, in the indigenous language of where they're at? And then I think of Hawaii and how uh, one of their grocery stores had just a bunch of signs in Hawaiian and just to say what the things are. But um, we broke folks into groups and we said, okay, for the, there's going to be one beginner and one intermediate, one advanced, and every sort of little pod. And every pod's going to have a task. And their task for the first hour is just to walk through this whole big store and just name as many things as you can. And if you don't know it, ask each other what it is. And then if you guys can't figure it out, look it up and just sort of figure out how to sort of say the names of things. Then we all met back after they did that for an hour. And I said, uh, okay, now I'm going to give you each 
uh, three things. And you're going to see the name of it, and then there'll be a translation, and don't show anybody. But now your task is to, and we gave everybody a map, and we sort of named every part of the store, like the frozen foods, the butcher, the, the coffee shop, the, the clothing stuff. You know, so we had names for all this stuff. And we said, okay, you can tell them the name of the place on the map to get yourself to a certain part of this big store. But then you cannot name the thing. You have to describe it and get the person to find what it is you have. So if you had a spatula, which I don't even know if there's a name for a spatula, you would have to get them to guess that you have spat. And you can just like walk over there and point at it. You're supposed to use the language to do it. So it was a bit of a task-based thing, and a lot of folks had fun. But there are two things that I, I thought of when I was listening to you talk, Puchain. One was uh, just the sort of level of nervousness that I think some folks had that we're just going to go places. And because what I also told them is they're, they're not to use English the whole time, that the whole two hours we were there, other than when we reconvened to sort of talk out how it was going. But I did give them each a set of these little handouts. It's a little tiny flyer that says, uh, thank you for understanding. We are not using English, so if we don't reply to you, it's because we're trying to stay in our language uh, outside of the classroom. So please don't be hurt. And um, so they would just hand it. And I'd watch the students. They would just hand it to someone because everybody knows a lot of people. Right? You go to these big stores and you're just going to see a bunch of people you know. And it was funny because the, the ones where I had to go and sort of pull people aside who were trying to visit with the students, it was always their relatives. So it was, it was a lot of Native people that I had to go and sort of pull them aside and say, hey, why don't you come talk to me and, and you know, let them stay in the language. But just to sort of to do that, to create these atmospheres of use, is a big challenge and it's also something that could be a lot of fun but I think you got to think about all these other things like one how do you keep the students from breaking out and going into English and two if you're gonna bring it out into the world how are you gonna get folks to know and it's not like every time it's got to be like this full-on immersion thing but if you're trying to use your language as soon as you let English in the door it's just gonna it's gonna take over it's like, oh, okay, let me explain this one thing. And then next thing you know, 20 minutes of the 40 minutes have gone by. Other thoughts? Anybody? Yeah, <clears throat> Who should do that? Like, um, even instead of going out to eat, we should just go, um, like one of our classes should just be walking to the ship and, like, name everything that we see. Like, along the way, we'll see a thing or a thing that we you know, wind fallen trees, dead yeah. trees, moss, so all these little things that we walk by all the time. And then, like, I always wish I had like a little pamphlet, just like have it right on me, just like a little laminated pamphlet, like this is what it is, right there. Like, all of it <laughs> <laughs> would be awesome. I mean, and that's something like I'd be up for. It. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we've been trying out in our language community for the last year, and that we're going to try and I gotta figure out like how to get this thing to really work. So one is like how does everybody stay in touch with each other? Because uh, texting is an option, but then you tend to have sort of just groups of friends. Uh, social media is an option, but some people are against it because they're gonna sell you to everybody. And so then looking into some other things, uh, there's a language student who told us about this program called Basecamp. So we started using Basecamp. And so, but the thing is like adding everybody to the roster, which is something I gotta get a little bit more organized on. However, the, the Basecamp thing I think is effective because one, you can message things, you can have a message board. It's pretty easy. There's an app you can download to your phone. It'll send you push, you gotta set it up so that it doesn't send you notifications for everything. Uh, however, like I think it'd be a pretty easy way to say, 
hey, I'm going down to dig clams. Anybody want to just come with me and speak the language and dig some clams or go for a walk or go bowling? We're going to just get the language community as sort of, and this is one of the really tricky parts, is sometimes you're going to have to do things with the language folks, and that means you're going to have to sort of not include every single person. But I, that's not to say I think people should be excluded, but the ones who should, you should just make sure that everybody knows that we're going to use the language in this. Uh, we're not here to necessarily teach you the language, although we could set, uh, set up those sessions as well. But just make sure you understand the intent of when you're going, who's going. But to create these language use environments, uh, it's tough. We, we had set up, we got some funding to set up these family nights where families could get together and just be in the language for a couple hours a week. And uh, we had some, we provided snacks, we did a whole bunch of stuff. And a couple things happened that I think kind of killed the idea. One is people were just showing up like there was a class, so they weren't, they didn't bring their kids. It's, it was like, we're supposed to have a bunch of kids that can interact and we can practice parenting and sort of collectively interacting with our children in the language. And two, it turned into this talk in English about our culture, so which is very important, but not the right thing for what we were doing there. And so I watched it for a while and then I said in our language, I can listen to English everywhere. I came here to use the language, to listen to the language, and we should use it. And there was someone there who was elderly, who whispered to me so other people couldn't hear, I disagree. And then kept going in English. And then I just, I stayed for a while, but then I just left. Because, you know, but then how do you get the sort of, so I guess there's a couple things. Like, how does everybody stay in touch with each other? How do you do this stuff in a way that's sustainable and is inviting, but also has the understanding, like, if you're going to keep speaking in English, you're going to have to, you're going to have to not come, or you're going to have to figure that part out. Go on, son, I see you get your hand up. No, go ahead. I, I, I actually was going back to the root word, uh, that uh, article, so I can wait. Oh, well, I was, I was, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on building, you know, building these communities of use and also doing stuff. Like there was a, there was a language, there's a group of learners who on Saturday, I was supposed to email everybody, but didn't. Uh, Saturday, they're just going for a, a language walk. You know, and so like doing stuff and being together and forming these continuing because I think continuing to grow the community also so that it doesn't depend on one or two people like there's no there's no flow through like how do we create this sort of environment where it's just someone has an idea they just throw it out there with the gang and and you know game nights whatever folks are wanting to do well whatever folks want to do they should bring the language there and then whatever they want to talk about Let's give them the tools for the language because then we might find we need some field guides and some other stuff like that. That's that. I know for me, that's what I would need. Like if there was going to be a gathering to have a script or like something beforehand so that I could go over it and feel like I had some understanding of what might come up so that I'd feel um, successful. I know that the new book that the second edition, Rene, I don't know if you did that in the first one, but just like filling out all those chunks of the what each piece means has been really helpful now that I'm taking intermediate Klingit to go back and see how everything is broken down. And please forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Is it Suzuk? Is am I saying that? Um, you did a wonderful uh, training on the language and using color and music and that I think about that all the time about um, doing something like that with the Tlingit language and, and in Waldorf they put color to you know 
verbs are red for fire and nouns are blue and they have characters and things but what you had done with the song I don't know if you want to share that but I love that idea because then I could see how the words connected to the English I mean as somebody who's learning it as a second language sorry Suzek are you there I don't mind sharing any time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, and I hadn't realized uh, where I had seen it until I was reading this this week and remembered that it was probably at his presentation at the um, Language Revitalization Institute, the one in Fairbanks, um, with a big reminder as to how, how much clearer and easier it is. So yeah, I could present at some point, model that little thing. Cool. And so part of this is community building, right? So we have to build the community of language speakers so that one, uh, we have people to talk to and that collectively, I think the more we bring the language out to places, the more we will realize where our gaps are as language speakers you know, because if it's always just sort of like teacher says it you repeat teacher says it you repeat like you can only take that kind of style so far i think then the other thing is this concept of domains and registers can anybody tell me what those two things are domains and registers Um, Hune, isn't a domain like a place where you speak language, such as like grocery stores or in the home? Um, and I always forget the difference with registers, though. Absolutely. So the domain is a physical or social place where you use the language. So and it could be a physical thing like shopping in the language at the grocery store, but it could also be sort of like going to fish camp and cutting the fish right so it's usually some sort of specific so if you narrow it down then the register is the set of language that you need to be able to function in that in that sphere so for example if i say okay we're gonna play volleyball in our language then we gotta know the name for volleyball for spike set bump whatever whatever the time, you know, go this way go that way the different areas of the court uh, out of bounds, you're lying, or whatever, whatever the types of things are. And then any sort of banter that goes along with it. Like um, if people want to talk some trash in the language, and we got to give them those tools. And, but we also got to sort of make sure we're not violating our cultures, but at the same time, uh, and there's always these sort of balances about giving the youth control of the language and then watching where they take it, which every single culture has to deal with that. But so what the process is called domain reclamation. So if you say, OK, we're going to go, we're going to go get a seal. We're going to clean that seal up. We're going to harvest it. We're going to process it. We're going to get the kids right up in there. Then you're going to need a whole bunch of vocabulary for that. And some of that's going to be the nouns. So what do you call the liver and what do you call the kidney and what do you call the knee bone and whatever and then part of it's going to be the the verbs so like for example we have a different verb for skinning a seal than skinning it like a moose those are two different verbs and then sort of like all the little and the step-by-step -step thing so that um one you could teach a skill to someone but then you can also teach them in the language. So one of the things I would say about domain reclamation, don't do teaching the skill and teaching the language at the same time. I, I think that that's just not, instead, do the thing collectively or, or start very simply and start with the building blocks of the language. Unless you're gonna go and study all of those terms first. So if you wanna talk about making a drum, you're going to have these like maybe 16 holes on the back and you're going to do some sort of pattern of you're going to be soaking the things and pulling them and talking about the tension and trying to get the tension right so it dries and it 
sounds correctly. Uh, and then, and then, um, then you go for. Do seals have knees? They have a hip. Hey, I meant to say a hip. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> There's gotta be some somewhere. <laughs> That's how they turn around so fast. That's right. <laughs> it's my dialect. Bro. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, but as you sort of think about these language activities, you're building the community, you're getting used to go out, do things, don't wait for it to, you know, use your ambition, create a, a community of doers so that, but also just sort of like, just be aware of some things as well. Like sometimes a community of people, if one person says, hey, let's all go do this thing, like a whole bunch of people are going to do it. But if someone else says, hey, let's go do this thing, no one's going to do it. So you know what? Do the thing. If, and, and to put this in, into context, um, when we were studying in Hawaii, uh, Mauna Kea was and still is a tremendous issue among Hawaiian peoples. Uh, it's a sacred mountain. They're trying to put these telescopes. So there's already telescopes up there, and they're trying to add more telescopes. And a lot of people are saying, "Stop! You're 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 desecrating our sacred mountain. Continuing to just put all this big, huge gear up there." And rearrange the whole landscape, and it was a it was a huge issue. They were we were there while Hawaiian police were arresting Hawaiian elders, and we're watching these police cry, and we're watching it's it was very emotional. We watched people give testimony in Hawaiian, entirely in Hawaiian, and getting arrested. And uh, We were involved with some folks who were involved with the university. So the University of Hawaii at Hilo had a lot invested in the telescope side of things. But then you had the language folks who, a lot of them had a lot invested in protecting the cultural sites. So we went to this uh, five-day teacher training, which was incredible. It was all in Hawaiian, and they basically, uh, they operate 11 months a year. They take one month off, and in the middle of that month, they have a five-day retreat where they talk about the themes of the next year and things to focus on and team building and a whole bunch of fun stuff. And at the end, and they, they go like 12 hours every day. I don't know how they did it because they would get up early, and everybody does a little exercise, and then they do a, a pula, they do a prayer, then they eat. And then they all start their sessions, and then the sessions go all day, then they have lunch, then they do sessions, they continue to go all day, then they have dinner, then they take a little break. Then everybody gets together and they start to party with each other until 1, 2 in the morning, then they, they're up at 6, 7 in the morning doing it again. But at the end of all of this, they all get together at this bar and they're just, they're singing hula songs and they're, they're dancing, it's just very, very fun. At one point, someone breaks out this chant from Mauna Kea, and it was powerful. Everybody's singing, doing like sort of this, like this, the symbol for the mouth. And we were singing, and then, you know, it got over. I was like, let's go kick them off the mountain right now. Everybody get off. And then I talked to uh, some folks the next day. I was like, that was so incredible. It was so powerful. Everybody must be so united about this idea. And the person said, well, you know, I'd say about half the room wants everybody off the mountain. Half the room is like, yeah, let's build more telescopes and do with the science folks. I said, really? But everybody was singing. They said, well, if they're doing a Hawaiian, everybody's in. So keep that mentality uh, so that you create an inclusive environment uh, with this as well. So, but then the other aspect is sort of like figuring out how you're going to take these places back. Because bringing the language to a place is also claiming that place for your, your indigenous language, right? The, the language needs a place to be. Ah, oh, um, Thinking back to Hawaii and that school when I was fortunate enough to be part of that group after you had already been there with the Hokulea conference, 
out there at that school every day when they were doing the prayer they start i can't remember the name of the plant but it was it was uh, pretty important to them and it was growing on a vine all down the entry of their school and they started every day by taking their ads they all cut they all cut they all collectively sung their morning prayer and then someone each day would get up on the ladder and take an ads and just every day just a little bit more of that vine and you know they had that board up there and you could see all the marks of every day starting off that way and to see all those marks was pretty powerful to put into perspective that every day you know they put their heads together and just get in the same mentality of language revitalization bringing back the culture and i think uh you know people say indian time or you know clink time like that was their hawaiian time was every day right on time with the ads and they started working so uh, those kind of indigenous ways in incorporation with uh western concepts of okay now it's time to work you know right now at this time uh that was really good to see you know and taking their shoes off at the door and just everyone had uh the same the same goal and the same mentality that was that was really cool to see over there yeah right like so as as you build these programs and these uh, you know whether it's a single class whether it's a course which is a series of classes or whether it's a whole program which is a collection of courses and that build towards some single thing or whether it's a whole school I think you have to figure out like what is the culture of that entity you know so yeah that the way they they blow the 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 conch shell and that's how the class and then they have the songs and then the like just such a you know, all the students have uniforms and stuff. And so like, as you map this stuff out, these are things that you can kind of start small. So you say, uh, okay, when our, when our little daycare, our little kids are there, when they first come in, this is how we greet them. This is what we have them do. This is how we let them know we're getting started. This is how, you know, especially if, when you're first getting started with these things, this is how we push them into the language, and especially those first like three months, that first three months trying to get the kids to just sort of be in the language the whole time. This is, and then it starts to grow. This is how we keep them in the language. And this is how we punish them for, you know, for speaking English. Um, I was in one class in Hawaii and they had a hat. You, you put a hat on because they were teaching English. So you had to put this hat on to use English. And then you take it off and so and it wasn't like a silly hat or it's just like a baseball cap but then uh i was talking to okawa noi kamana and she said one of their strategies because they couldn't get kids to stop using english they said oh you like you like english you want to use english okay and they give them a national geographic and they say pick an article out there and you got to write the whole article by hand and that was their punishment for speaking english because yeah, it's at some point, like especially if you build a program and you got kids, if the kids are going to grow up and then start rebelling, they're going to rebel by using English. Right? That's, that's probably one of the ways they're going to do it. So, okay. Anybody else have any thoughts on any of the stuff that we've read? The root word method, the Maori, the um, organizations. Can I, can I go? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I need to raise my hand. Sometimes I feel like a sea lion, I tell you. Um, it's scary, but I will do this. Sometimes I keep falling off into the sea. I'm one of those speakers, you know, I get really afraid. A sock, sha ar klake, e jidach, guch la hash, e kus e ye. It's just a simple thing, but it's very soothing. And my family, we're learning to say it. 
And I'm finding that I have more um, courage <laughs> when the opposite clan is there and they they, they say, uh, they just pet me on my cheek and they, you know, we help and we hold each other up. And so the Nushkitans and my family and the Yakshi, we have plans for having our Okoi. We'd like to be able to say something in Tlingit. And many of us don't speak Tlingit. She's beautiful and she understands everything that is said. And Carolyn, you know, these are Wishkitan women. It's just would be nice to get them to get up and talk. So um, it's nice they, you know, they're right there and they're, they're helping. So at Koei, I think that's just a simple gathering that works really good in the past and can work again in the future. But what I said, and I just probably messed it up, but it says, how do we keep our way of life from drifting away forever? And I think Koei and putting our names back on everything. And I know that was your first question you asked, and it took me this long to get my courage to reply. Thank you, Gunas Cheese. Okay, Gunas Cheese. Yeah, so I, and moving, like some of these things I think of as well. Like, so I, I'm always thinking, like, what's the now, what's the later, what's the now, what's the later? Because you, you got to find ways to divide some of the work, because there's the work just never ends. But then, also just sort of like the other things I think about is sort of like what's going to be the things at the individual and family level, what's going to be the things at the organizational community level, and what's going to be the things at the federal, national, international level. So part of it is not just creating a community of users of the language, well th th this is what it is, but creating a place where people feel okay speaking. That is such a huge, huge part of it. Because I do think when it comes to what colonialism does, I feel like a lot of times we do that to ourselves in a lot of really strange ways. Um, but then sometimes it's not, you know, I, I'll see people switch over to English because they'll say, well, nobody would understand what I have to say here, so I'll just use English, even though they were brought in specifically to be using the language. And for, for some of them, I think it's important for them to know, like, hey, they might not understand now, but if you just keep going and keep trying it and keep doing it, they're going to understand. And, and so, um, and then coming back to this overcoming the psychology of use, like this fear that something's going to happen, this pain, this, these other things are very, very real, very scary. But then how do we create an environment where we deliberately overcome those? And, and it could be, for starters, folks are just reading from a script. It's totally fine. It's fine. And then there's other times where maybe people work in teams. So we did an exercise one time where we said, okay, we're going to make a model ceremony right now. We're just going to pretend that happened. So all the eagles go over there, all the ravens go over there. So we kind of divide into these two sides. And I said, okay, here's the situation. The Te D have just raised a totem pole. And after the totem pole raised, they had a big celebration. They had Kuik, they had potlatch, and they invited us all in. They took good care of us. And the ravens are now standing up to begin to say thank you. Everybody go write your speeches. And then they did that. And then we had the eagles. And we adjourned. And we said, OK, all you eagles, write your responses. And so we, we practiced sort of doing that in a fictional scenario. Because you don't want to always just have to do that when things are really like somebody passes away or there's some sort of there's a lot of cultural pressure to get it right anyways. So then we just removed that and we did these sort of, and it was very fun and, and people had a lot of fun and they laughed a lot. And I think it took a lot of the pressure off. So like getting folks to laugh and getting it to just be fun and, and doing a lot of collaborative work as well, while folks are just sort of building up those skill sets.
So another thing I said would look at the GIDs, but I also asked you folks to create some sort of map based on uh, the language and the organizations that are involved. So someone sent me one and we could look at that, but did anyone else, did anyone else do this? You could hand draw it, you could have used uh, stained glass, Photoshop, I carved it out of wood. I made one, Jone. This is Salakuna Sandy. You want to show it to us? I can share my screen. Let me see if I can do that here. You should be able to. Okay. It might be small print there. Um, I'm using Mira, the um, mapping tool that you suggested when I emailed you. So thank you for responding so quickly. I'm used to using Microsoft Teams. I'm trying to figure out, here we go. Is someone else ready to share while I get my, um, set up my preferences so that I can share my screen? Sure. Ansan, do you wanna share? Sure, I I have to admit I had put started this a couple a year ago when I was looking for funding for um, the Ha to Yeyeti and just making sure we weren't duplicating what was already out there. So it was I was saying to Hune it was nice to go back to it because the organizations have since built you know added more into what they're offering and so it just reminded me it's good to go back even after a year to see what has changed and what's been added. So, yeah, this is, um, I didn't have Douglas Indian Association last time. And I, I um, some, it's interesting, some is through word of mouth. Like I'm lucky enough to know that some things are going on, but they might not be listed on the website. And I used Hune's, um, PH, his dissertation is really incredible as far as how to think about systems. And so I was like, okay, let's look at the micro, the meso, and the macro, and where are organizations kind of filling those gaps, and, and where could I, or we as a team, fill what, what hasn't been done. And so, yeah, I don't know how much to talk about it other than that I kind of wrote down what I saw that these organizations were offering. And because I'm involved in the school district, you know, and I don't have my own kids, so I immediately was looking at how I could support in the school district in a system and knowing that the TCLL program is an incredible program. Um, I don't know what the number of kids that it reaches, but how could I help reach kids who weren't in that program? And so um, that's how Last year, Jean Cassie and I worked on the Hakusti through the Cultural Lens Program, and now this year, the Hatu Yeyeti with lots of um, folks from different um, organizations. And it was great to put down UAS has teaching certificates in language and um, and teaching, and so that was exciting. And um, I'm, and I'm pursuing that so that I can hopefully show teachers that they should be adding that to their toolkit. They have certificates that they pursue in other things and they should be doing it for the Tlingit language. Fabulous. Heather, I see your I can see I, I didn't do um, a fancy drawing, um, and that was a beautiful graphic, uh, but I had a lot of the major players that Lori has, um, but I also added, I think the whole UA system is at the macro level, uh, the Board of Regents included, um, and the state, the, our legislators and our governor um, should also be playing a role. So um, I think I also had uh, Head Start organizations too, because we wanna start as early as possible. Fabulous. Sheesh. Selectina, are you ready? Yeah, if um, so I, I got kicked off just as I started to um, work on my settings. And so I don't know if my internet is, is going to be stable here, but I'm going to give it a try now. 
Oh, that's right, because Zoom probably had to restart. Um, you know, I don't know. And let me try this here again. Okay, you're gonna have to go to someone else. I'm still not there yet. No worries. <laughs> Sometimes like shared your screen before, like Zoom and your computer have to have some kind of yeah. I've only used Microsoft Teams on this new new to me computer, so I've gotta mess with the preferences. I'll I'll be I'll be set in a second. Anybody else want to show us what you got or talk about your ideas and how you're going to do that? Um, I could talk about a few things. Um, in Canada, there's the Kids and Calum um, Head Start, which I'm helping um, Dr. Michael out with right now. And then there's also um, Had Killed Nye. It's, um, it's a, I think it's a language organization, but throughout the summer, they had um, beginning hot kill class to join. And then um, there's also um, Simon Fraser University where they have a First Nations linguistics master's degree. Um, I'm still waiting for the border to open where I can defend my, my master's project. And then um, Ketchikan Indian community, they um, have all three of the Southeast um, languages. And then there's a, a language facilitator and a, um, a apprentice. And they take turns going into the, the local school districts. I think it's because it's smaller, um, a lot smaller than Juno. They all three take turns going into K High. And I think this year, um, Shamalia did it last year. So I think it's Clinkett. Um, this year, so they'll have two years of going into the school district. Um, and then there's, I forgot what the name of it was offhand, but in Heidelberg, the immersion preschool that they have. And I know a few of the, the cohorts um, help out in that too. Those are the ones off the top of my head. <laughs> Wonderful. Direction. So just like, I think about this stuff quite a bit and I'm going to show you folks a, a couple of things, probably including the gigs. And, and we've got Wednesday too. So if uh, your, your pencil wasn't sharpened or the computer wasn't responding or um, uh, anything that kept you from doing this, or maybe you just forgot, whatever. Like just kind of create a map of the organizations that are linked to your language program and think about how you want to sort of represent that visually. And we're going to also go over some tools on Wednesday and, and we're going to do some of this stuff collaboratively as well. Because even when I say that, it's interesting because it's almost like there's got to be some layers. It's almost like put your genealogy up on this thing. And then the genealogy is like, well, how, how far do I go out to cousins or do I go out to, uh, you know, how, how far does this thing go? And so sometimes this stuff is sort of like, who is in your language working in your language? And sometimes it's, it's good to map that stuff out because you're like, what are these guys doing? Are we talking to each other? How do we get more coordinated? How do we make sure we're not duplicating efforts? And, and you know, and how do we make sure that we're, we're collaborating as well? And then sometimes it is, for me, this is sort of the, this is my macro level one. Uh, and so I just wanted to share sort of my process and, and just sort of like the nuts and bolts of how I do this stuff is sometimes I'm going to use, I did this one in a program called Illustrator. Uh, and so it has a lot of visual options. It has a lot of abilities to do some things that I kind of like to just make it visually snappy but then if you want something that's a little more interactive and sort of fast and a team building stuff uh, we're going to take a look at this program called Miro. Now I mentioned two programs today one's called Basecamp one's called Miro and I've been sort of experimenting with these for the past uh, year especially and if you have an account that's linked to an to school so if you're a student or a teacher 
and especially if you're linked to some sort of edu or school district type of thing i think you get both of these for free and they're very they seem pretty powerful in terms of what they do and they also seem pretty expensive uh, so what i was thinking of is like what are the missing elements that i see in alaska in order to really keep opening the doors to language medium education and also like uh, language immersion, dual language, cultural schools, all that kind of stuff, but especially for language revitalization. So there's a lot of stuff that already exists. And so I was thinking of, um, so basically if you take a look at this thing, see if I can zoom, is you have things that already exist, like tribal governments, federal government, the state constitution, the Alaska state government, which is composed of the legislature and the governor and the lieutenant governor. But then if these things have like a little splotchy thing behind them, it means that's something shiny and new that we should make. And one would be an office of Alaska Native Affairs, which under the current governor is not going to happen. But there's elections coming, whatever. Uh, then we sort of, we do have the Alaska Native Language Advisory Council which is currently called the Alaska Native Language Preservation and Advisory Council. Uh, and that, that already exists. The State Board of Education already exists. There are language nests. Uh, there's a language medium school, at least one that I know of. Uh, and there are public school language programs. So I think to tie these things together, you form the Alaska Native Language Schools Consortium, which is essentially a statewide school board that helps to unify these programs and to advocate for them. You already have uh, Alaska Tribal Colleges. You already have UAF and UAA and UAS. You have the Board of Regents. But you don't have an Alaska Native University, and I think you could have that. And I think it could start with the College of Alaska Native Languages. Um, and then sort of, and you already have the Alaska Native Language Center, the Alaska Native Archive. So some of this stuff you do to sort of try and envision like what are the needs and how do you get there? How do you map it out so that folks can see it? Because I think one of the things about continue, like if you want to take a language from a place where it isn't to a place that it is, which is usually not safe to safe, you have to engineer a whole series of social changes. And this is going to make people very uncomfortable. Like, when I first presented this idea, which was at that symposium at Fairbanks, we were having such a wonderful time that I had this, that like this idea came to me. I was like, here, I think these are the institutions we need to make. And, this, and I sort of like drew this whole map. Maybe it was a different version of it. And then I presented on it the next day. And some folks got really mad. They said, you got to tell us if you're going to present on this stuff. I said, well, I just, I just did it like 3 o'clock in the morning. You want me to call you? Are we doing something? Are we just being interactive here? Or who do I have to run this stuff by before I share my ideas? It's getting a little frustrating. But just thinking of these things and how to, how to continue to engineer change and what is that change seeking to do? And I think that brings us to uh, the GIDS, which I got a, I thought I had it in here. Let me check. I have a question about the um, school boards who approve the uh, type M certificates for language teachers here in Juneau. Is that under the municipality? Because I'm thinking about like who provides funding for language teachers. Yeah, okay. So um, a type M is usually, my experience has been a school and some sort of expert in that field collaborate and basically write le reference letters for the person who wants the type M. And then it's awarded to them based on, I think a co, and let me know if you guys know this. It seems like it's a co-sponsorship between somebody who knows the content area and the school. And it could involve a tribe as well. But I think it's usually just those two things, like somebody who knows the content and the school. So like if it's a language, they'll look for a letter from a, someone who teaches the language who says, yeah, this person can teach the language. They're really good. 
and they grant them the Type M certificate. The current goal is to replace the Type M certificate with a full teacher license and certificate in Alaska Native Languages. But that's a couple years away. So I just have a quick comment if, if it's okay. Uh -huh. So based on what I have researched and looked at the website, um, I had a complete, what I thought understanding of what it is and what it can be and how we can go in that direction. And then I was talking to um, School of Ed in, at UAF and their experience with the type M um, sounded a whole lot different than what it appears on the paper from the state of Alaska. Mm -hmm. And so um, I actually plan to call them this week <laughs> and make sure that I understand what it is because I am going to put 10,000 10, hours, millions, and in, invest my whole being into um, getting our bilingual teacher certified through M and um, what that'll look like and what it'll mean um, for us. And so far, my assumptions seem to be erroneous. So I plan to <laughs> research that. And once I find more, I would gladly report back at some future point. Great. So it sounds like Wednesday, we're going to talk about type M certificates. So let's all like, if folks have knowledge, share it. I'll go look up some things. I'll talk to some of my contacts. Uh, we also need to Share some well, I guess I'm you have something to share? Yeah, so um, I applied for the Type M, and uh, it was kind of like, so a, like a woodshop teacher can get a Type M, and uh, I was taking over like the woodshop teaching, and it was going to be carving, so it was like a, a language in a woodshop Type M, and uh, the school district asked me to get the Type M. Uh, I did end up leading the classes. I got my Type M after. And now I'm still waiting to hear back whether or not I even got it. So they're kind of on their end, like, just to give me the type M so I could, you know, work in another class if I wanted here in the Juno School District. I can't without it. I mean, I could because I already did, but right. I don't have the document that says you are a type M certified. So it's really like them just holding back, getting me that document. And it's been a few months now. Yeah. Because the type M also seems, it's like, if you got one, my, my understanding would be like, let's say you got a type M to teach carving at Thunder Mountain High School in Juneau, Alaska. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could just say, okay, I'm going to take this type M and I'm going to move to Metlakatla and I'm going to teach carving there. Like you would have to apply for a whole new type M. Because yep. it seems to be, there's a content specialist and then there's the school those two combine for a single type M certificate, which is author. It says the state authorizes you to teach this content at this place. Just the one place. Yep. Yeah. And I do think we need to. We well, th that's fine. It's a yes and. We also need something else so that someone can. And you know there is a future I think where someone does native arts and cultures, whether it's dance or whether it's carving or beading or whatever, and that they can also pursue a licensure in that. Because someone could go get, they could go get a full teacher certification to go teach painting. And painting is just fine, but it's not more important than beadwork and artwork and weaving. Those are all things as well. And so one of the challenges of education is, let's think about this today. Education is probably the most marginalizing thing in the United States of America is very, very good at keeping things out. And so the, the whole history of education, I think needs, it just continually needs to be analyzed and adjusted. And you got to take whole sets of words like Western, modern, uh, normal, mainstream, typical, and just get them out of the whole system. Like, don't use those words. I think they're very loaded words and they're ways to say, let's just do colonial white people stuff. Because it's from a perspective of an indigenous person, because then you're going to end up with arts and artifacts, literature and storytelling. 
uh, science and ecological knowledge so that you can have the stuff and then you have these other lesser versions which get their own special titles and and, and for me that's one of the difficulties of the type M is it just even though it's not intended to do that I think you have this separate and not as good mentality when you when you go with those types of things and so the goal for that I'm is sorry feel a different go ahead Kone, I, I was just uh, to get to achieve curricular equity it can't it ha everything has to be on equal ground everything has to be as important and it, the lack of disparity as you always say um but i was wondering i know that we we got those passed, the certificates program passed through Academic Council and through the BOR. So is, is the next phase of that, the university system creating um, the language? We've got the language courses. So what, what do we need to do to get those certificates in play right now? Yeah, so we have the certificates, which are through the university. And so I'll be working with the Department of um, Education to sort of say, recognize these. So that's that's going to be one of the parts. The next part is this year we're proposing an Indigenous Studies bachelor's degree, and then next year we're going to propose a Master of Arts in Teaching Indigenous Languages. So the language is going to lead the route for that. In the meantime, we'll continue to explore, you know, the arts options as well for for folks. And then there's the whole sort of like you have folks who are cultural experts. And I think the missing element probably for that is what I would call indigenous sciences. And so to, to sort of con to retire the term uh, ecological knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge. And these were terms that they filled their purpose. They did wonderful things. But now you know, the way this stuff goes is it, is it opens a door and then it gets marginalized and it opens a door and then it gets marginalized so then you got to keep building yourself up and say okay yeah you guys you guys got science we got science too we always have and so just to continue to sort of uh it's a bit maddening because it's almost like that game with a little weasel pops up and you gotta hit it with the hammer and another one hit it with the hammer so you gotta do a little bit of that stuff but um yeah and then you just start working towards equity to say yeah we could and, and there's there'll be a day where there's multiple paths to education and those paths will include indigenous languages and i know we're out of time so just one more comment we got wednesday too so those of you who are doing the tpr presentation nine days from now um you guys you have time so just start looking at stuff we'll, we'll do our sign-in sheet on wednesday share everybody's information make sure that we can function as teams and it's a no pressure thing. You're just sort of sharing some things and helping us lead it, helping us uh, have a discussion. Yeah, that's something I think, I mean, just like you were saying, uh, like a Northwest Coast art class. I mean, technically, if you're just looking at, like it says Northwest Coast art, you can come in there and be weaving instead of just carving. I mean, it doesn't, it's, it could be weaving from anywhere from California all the way up to like the Sigtiac. I mean, there are all so many different styles that just lumping them all up into one, like you may as well just call it Eskimo weaving or Athabascan weaving, because that's pretty much what it is. Like you say Northwest Coast art, it's just lumping them all up into one, one ball that it should be broken down because it is, like you said, a skill. I mean, it's not like weaving a basket, for instance, something you're gonna cook out of or drink out of that's gonna hold water. That takes some serious skill to make that or to make a dugout that's gotta be steamed open or you know, a box that you're taking a piece of wood and just bending it. Like that takes skill and not just art. I mean, it's it's all defined as art, but it's all, we all have our different ways of doing it. Like even in this class, how many different people and we all made it different ways. But when you go to an art class, it's just one way. And it should be kind of defined that way. Like it should be, can get tied to it since then, so on, so on, so on, because that's who you're learning from. You're never really learning from someone who's going to teach you all the different ways of making them. <clears throat> and yeah, I just I agree. I think it should be more well defined than. Right, because yeah, I mean, that's that's the progression as you go from a native studies class, which is one period a day, perhaps. Yeah. You said like a high school, 
where they're going to do study hall and then they're going to learn about native people and then they're going to do artwork and they're going to do the language and they're going to do the songs and they smush it all together yeah, like everybody that. else has time and space and so yeah the, the thing is to continue to sort of push and push and push until half your time spent doing one type of thing half your time spent doing the other type of thing yeah like the geometry class here at us should be even the best because it's pretty much all it is is geometry or, or what is it it's, you know there's a better term to define it as what it actually is right. the math class that could be the math class i mean how many more people would draft it yeah ethno mathematics so um we'll pick it up on wednesday Brown fires, good stuff. <laughs> okay, take care, folks. We'll uh, we'll pick it up on Wednesday. We'll do Miro. We'll do Gids, and we'll just keep changing the world. So good stuff. And Kune, I missed the sign up, so you know me. As after school club starts next week, so just let me know how I can do the work. If even if like I create something to add to the conversations, but I probably won't physically be at the class on the classes starting next week because yeah. Jan just like you, you can work it out with your team where like you don't have to be here but they'll, they'll provide true. that and it'll be fine is, is there a sign up or I tried to look on the classes or did I we'll not? do it on Wednesday okay sounds good take care folks okay cool me too because I finally couldn't make it last time, and I still didn't watch the recording yet, but I found it. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, we'll go over that, and let me, let me share that, and I'll come up with some other ways to get the content to folks. Thanks. Boyana. Okay. I just emailed the guy again about my...